I'm going to sit down today. I put the chair here in case I felt like it and I feel like it. So uh, I really want to extend my appreciation, particularly to John DePetty, who has managed to oversee the last three Sundays when I have been unable to be here. Uh, I did time it conveniently because two of them did have uh, other speakers and other things scheduled, so it wasn't as challenging as it might have been, but I do know that um, when I'm not here to have have someone who is able to uh, step in and manage things so beautifully uh, is indeed a comfort to me and reduces my anxiety quite incredibly. So thank you, John. And also to others, uh, Randy, everyone who stepped in and, and made those three weeks of rest possible for me. Um, Scott now has pneumonia, as he shared with you, and uh, we'll continue our journey toward wellness over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks, but we will have opportunity to be with you again on Thursday night at the Longest Night Service and on uh, next Sunday when we welcome, uh, particularly welcome people who would otherwise be spending Christmas morning alone, uh, and hopefully we can create uh, in this space an opportunity for some communal cheer next uh, Sunday morning when we gather. As I was uh, preparing for the service this week and came across these uh, snippets of things from Charles Dickens, uh, I was reflecting on who he was and the gift that he offered uh, the United Kingdom, offered Britain at that point in time, London particularly, uh, when he would write these incredibly uh, descriptive novels that showed to those people who read them the realities with which many of the people uh, in London had to live at the time, realities that those who had access to books and, and knew how to read uh, were far for, removed from the realities of, of poverty, of endless work, of uh, the challenges of making ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone at a time of year when celebration called forth even greater uh, things from you than you sometimes were able to bring to bear. And so it seemed appropriate to offer his readings this Sunday before Christmas as we enter a week that will be full of, of gift and uh, rejoicing and also uh, for many of us uh, memories that are not as, as bright and beautiful as Christmas cards, pictures might have us believe. Uh, there, there is in each of our lives uh, something that draws us closer to the realities and the, and the pain and discomfort that Charles Dickens portrayed through his novels, uh, something that we carry with us into every family gathering, into every uh, opportunity for uh, communal cheer that tempers our cheer to an extent, some uh, more than others, uh, but it offers us the opportunity to reflect on the challenges that many do face in the world uh, that are incredibly greater than what it is that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. These days, if I want to be inspired to any significant extent, I go to winners. Winners are home sense. And not because I'm a shopaholic, but because their uh, picture department has uh, taken on this uh, inspirational quote theme. And if you go to any Winners or Home Sense and you rifle through the pictures uh, or the painting section, you come across, you know, abstract stuff that means something to someone, but rarely anything to me. Uh, traditional prints from the masters. Uh, this uh, last time I was there, there were a uh, number of things by the group of seven, which was interesting. Uh, and, and framed mirrors from mirrors framed with mirrors to uh, those in more traditional wooden frames. And inspirational quotes galore. All these things that we could put on our walls through our homes and they would perk us up every minute of the day as we would come across them. But one that took my fancy the last time I was there, and it would have been on the wall here somewhere if it hadn't been damaged, as so many of those pictures are at Winners and Home Sense from people rifling through them, was one that had a more or less theme. 
and it would say more something, less something else. More something, less something else. And it went through using the uh, rainbow colors to get through this theme of more of what we would want in our lives, that breathe in the goodness and then less of that which we could breathe out, that stuff that weighs us down and, and challenges us. And so for this morning, I'm bringing you Christmas more or less with uh, things that we could do well to get a little more of. Uh, some of them you've mentioned in our, in our uh, 14 things of Christmas or 15, however we, we got to during the, during the earlier time in the service. Uh, but for each of the letters of the word Christmas, I have found a more and a less, and I'm hoping to share them with you today. Less carelessness, more compassion. Were we to add up all the time that each of us in this room and then think of the community at large and then think of the world, all of the time that goes into seeking out the perfect gift or creating the perfect dinner around this festival season, it would be a phenomenal amount of time. The amount of time that goes into that is con incredible. But it's not lost time. I'm not thinking of, you know, the wasted hours that we all spend doing that polity stuff at Presbytery, about which I spoke several weeks ago. I'm talking about time thinking about other people and what they might like. It's time that uh, flips that uh, train track in our brain trips the thought train toward the frontal lobe. And in that area, up at that conference table where we can pull up and talk about what might happen in the future, we grow our ability for compassion. We become more compassionate people. Now true, when we think about being compassionate, we usually think of someone who has, uh, someone whose circumstances are experiencing some kind of challenge or suffering someone, and our heart is warmed to respond to them in a way that can bring them comfort or ease their distress. And we think of compassion in that manner. But it's exactly the same thing that's happening when we're doing our consequential thinking. And it's consequential thinking that we're using to figure out what the people that we love might like as a gift. We're thinking about what their face might look like if they opened up this or they opened up that. Or we're considering what it is that they uh, want in their lives that we might be able to bring about through our gift. So all those hours that are spent trying to figure out the perfect gift, if we think about them, they're hours that could be spent in compassion, compassionate thought, in building compassion in the world. The carelessness with which we sometimes bluster our way through the holidays is what we could have less of. Because when we're thinking in a careless manner, we're often not thinking, we're just reacting. We're just doing what needs to be done because it has to be done. And we've all in our lifetimes received gifts that were gifts that were given just because they needed to be given. Uh, that thought, that compassion, that, that flick of the thought train to the frontal lobe didn't happen when somebody was picking that thing up for me. It was a careless act, uh, an act that comes more out of our just our need to do something because it needed to be done. So this Christmas, I would like us to do less of that careless stuff and more compassionate thinking uh, as we move through these times. Less horror, more honesty. In the past few weeks as I've been ill, I've been spending a considerable amount of time on Twitter. Uh, do people know what Twitter is? Some of you may, some of you may not. Twitter is a new way to follow what's happening in the world. Julie mentioned it earlier during the time of prayer as how she found out about Vaclav Havel's death. It's how I found out about Christopher Hitchens' death just a few days ago. Uh, it's a news feed that people run. It's not run by a corporation or anything. It's I put my own little bit of news out there in 140 characters or less. And it goes out to anybody who's following me who might want to have an interest in what it is that I'm saying. And so over 
over the last few weeks, I've been building my uh, Twitter uh, people that I follow so that I can find out some interesting things that are happening in the world. And I do, and very quickly. As soon as something hits uh, the news, wherever, it can be sent out around the world with incredible speed. And if it's got a number sign and a word after it, uh, like a uh, number sign and occupy, if you click on that, every tweet, that's what Twitter writing things are called, every tweet that has that hashtag on it, as it is called, shows up in a list. So if I put a number sign, Vaclav Havel, everyone who has posted anything about him will show up if they've put that particular code on it. But one of the things that I've come up against very quickly in this uh, expansion of the number of people that I follow on Twitter is the amount of horror there is in the world. Because people are very quick to pass on uh, links that will take me to a page that tells me about something that's happened in some city or some place in the world about, about a, a brutal police arrest or a horrific murder or a terrible accident or uh, an eruption of conflict somewhere in the world. And the horror quotient to which I had exposed myself over these past weeks has risen exponentially. So much so that one day when I was feeling particularly lousy and had really spent the entire day in bed on my computer, um, I had exposed myself to so many awful things that I was just downright depressed by it all. So this Christmas I want less horror, but more honesty. It's not that all those things that were tweeted weren't honest. Uh, they were giving real pictures of what the world was like. And it's not that I want to anesthetize myself to what's really happening in the world. As uh, I posted something on Facebook a few days ago or at some point when I was ill, and someone uh, answered it saying that they don't want that kind of thing to show up on their page because it upsets them too much. And so they only want to have people posting to their page that that post nice, inspirational, loving things. And I totally resonate with that. But I also want to know what's happening in the world. I want reality to enter my living room or my bedroom or wherever it is that I happen to be reading these things. But I want it to be just honest. I don't want it to be histrionic. I don't want it to bring me graphic images. I don't want it to really numb me to what goes on. And so this Christmas, I would prefer to have more honesty and less horror. Less rigidity and more rejoicing. Traditions are things that we hold very close to our hearts. They, some of them, have been part of our lives uh, since we were very little children. Some of them are newer ones that have been offered to us by new families we've come into, or new friends, or new opportunities in our world. But traditions can also bind us to a past that can never free us, that will not free us. And so if we are extremely rigid about them, we can't create new meaning in our lives. We can't find blessing in new places. We can't decide that we're going to do something differently than we did before. And we lose the opportunity to uh, move into potential blessing and gift and new life. Some of the traditions that have been overturned in the last little while is, is uh, the idea that only a man and a woman can be married. And that was unsettled as we developed a new tradition of celebrating and recognizing the marriage of same-sex couples. And it is a rich tradition now uh, for many people. We upturn traditions periodically when we outgrow them and come into new ways of being present to reality. And there is where rejoicing can take place. When we celebrate old traditions with integrity and with honor and because they have meaning in our lives, then we can rejoice. 
And when we create new ways of being together, new opportunities for conversation, new tables with different faces around them, there's opportunity for rejoicing because we will grow and we will stretch and we will come to see the world in myriad new ways. And this is a gift. So this year, less rigidity, more rejoicing. Less in and more involved. We can numb ourselves to almost anything that's happening around us uh, by overexposing ourselves to it or by uh, retreating from it and never exposing ourselves to it. Either of those are pretty effective. And I think that it's been really important that we've been able to do that. In fact, I would bet that we have survived, that we're here uh, because we were able to ramp down uh, the the emotional uh, fear-based responses uh, that would come out in the face of many of the things that we experience and, and, and carry with us in our lives. If we weren't able to numb ourselves to them, we would never survive them. And so our ability to do that is a very important one, and it's been very good. But we can also lose ourselves in that numbing reality. We can lose our sense of compassion. We can lose our ability to be present to people because we don't take their experiences to heart, because we don't open ourselves to their realities, and because we don't open ourselves to ours, we can find ourselves in exactly the same situation. And so it's important that we step away from uh, being in a group or a perspective or an understanding that will only somehow ricochet around uh, its worldview, just stays in that one uh, ever-circling understanding. We never get outside of what we think is safe to experience what's going on in the rest of the world. Religion has been the great anesthetizer of our, of our lives, of our species. Uh, when we couldn't uh, accept or cope with realities in the world, we created gods, we created belief systems that could get us over that hump of anxiety, help, us, help numb us to what was happening immediately around us and allow us to live beyond that. And when we were part of that in, that safe group, we were okay. But the evolution of that in-group into what it is that we need now, the evolution of in is involved. We become, we evolve into involved. We become involved with those who are beyond our in-group, beyond the way, safe ways that we have come to see the world. And so because I think it is so crucial that we do see the world as others see it and that we then become involved in those worlds, in their realities, that we move away from in, from our in interpretations to involved uh, at this time of the year. We think ourselves through from just ourselves to a broader understanding of ourselves. Less selfishness, more self-respect. There's a fine line between those two. We are inundated. Uh, I've said this so many times. We're inundated 24-7 by messages that tell us what it is that we deserve. And it's all good. We deserve the best of this and the best of that. We deserve happiness that can come to us through a a never-ending list of media, through colognes, through decor, through clothing, through hairstyles. Tell I'm struggling with that one. (laughs) We can find our ways to an incredible sense of uh, self-value, self-worth, just by watching television and being told at every commercial break how much we deserve. But there's a very fine line between our self-esteem and the selfishness that that is really leading us to. The selfishness that leads us away from what we, as a a species that inhabits this planet and shares it with others, and we, as individuals, uh, need. We need to see that line 
and find ourselves clear on the side of it that calls us to living with dignity with all life on this planet. It means that we have to respect who we are, deeply respect who we are as individuals, but not necessarily as individuals that should be privileged beyond every other life form on this planet. And so this Christmas, a little less selfishness, a little more self-respect will, I think, bring us to a place of peace. Now with tea, I really wanted to go a little less Twitter and a little more talk, but I'm really enjoying the Twitter thing. So I stepped away from that one. I went to less timidity and more truth. Having run through half this list, it's pretty clear that there's a theme that threads its way through the words I've chosen, and that theme is truth. That we find our way toward an understanding of what it is that's in front of us that tells us truth, that is clear enough for us to see. It's a challenging thing. But I think that we have been timid in the face of truth. We often are. It's so much easier for us to just uh, believe those commercial breaks, for us to think that our relationships are infallible, for us to be sure that the world will always turn in the way it's turning. And we are timid about the truth related to those things. And so I believe that we need to step into that place of truth, which means we have to step out of our comfort zone. Uh, Dorley, can't remember her last name, the 85-year-old who was pepper sprayed at Occupy Seattle a few weeks ago, uh, used that phrase, stepping one step outside your comfort zone. When we go one step outside our comfort zone, the world looks dramatically different from what it looked like when we were inside our comfort zone. But you can't take that step if you are timid, and you can't take that step if you are afraid of truth. And so this Christmas, let's have a little less timidity have the courage to take that one step outside our comfort zone and seek truth. It's out there, and we dearly need to know it. Less madness and more meaning. I probably don't even have to describe madness for you at this time of year. Uh, It's a crazy world out there. Uh, And fortunately, I've been too ill to hit the shopping malls, and I've been able to do shopping online. Uh, Great links on Twitter to some interesting shopping sites. But but I've been able to avoid uh, the arguments that go on in parking lots and the long lineups in stores, Uh, the, the YouTube videos of shoppers being driven over with shopping carts. And I didn't actually click on that one. I just read the title. Uh, the frantic pace of, of consumption that takes place this time of year is deeply troubling and nothing if not madness. Somewhere in the middle of it, though, each of us stands surrounded by that craziness. And each of us is responsible for finding our own meaning in the midst of that madness. Where do we find it? How do we create it? How can we share it? Is it real? Meaning is what pulls us through madness. Meaning is what gives us hope. Meaning is what offers us a future that we can try to build with each other, that we can look forward to celebrating with each other. It is the only cure to madness. And so, at the center of the madness that goes on around you, seek out true relationships, intense and honest conversation, love that can look you in the eye and not look away, 
and a dream that through the course of this past year, you may have let waver or dim a bit, but that can call you to a future that is all of you. Bring that out and that madness will abate. A little less madness this Christmas and a little more meaning. One of the people that I have started following on Twitter is Charles Bavona. He's a poet and an interesting man. In one of his poetic works, which isn't in rhyming couplets or you know anything that looks like a poem, it's more like a just a journal entry. He talks about you know being crazy and seeing a therapist about that and telling the therapist about what he'd been reading and what he'd been exposing himself to just before his appointment about the realities that were taking place around the world in places of conflict, about the hunger, about the abuses, uh, financial abuses taking place in the world around him and the, and the very real people consequences uh, that were attached to those, about the lack of health care, about trauma and disease and loss. He told all of that to a psychiatrist who looked at him and said, you're an angry man. And Bavona said, I'm not angry. I'm enraged. There's a difference. A little less anger this Christmas can move us to a place where we are enraged. Enraged isn't ra- anger just ramped up. Enraged is a something you can do about your anger. Enraged is an opportunity to engage about anger. Anger's in there for sure. But enrage can take it to a consequence that has some more purpose, that has some more value in this world. And once you're enraged, you're already outside of your comfort zone. Because most of us don't want to be enraged. But once you're enraged, you're in for adventure. You're in for adventure writ large because you are no longer a passive participant in life. You are fully engaged and part of what the change this world needs to see is you, part of the change. A little less anger, a little more adventure, adventure bracketed by being enraged and by the change you want to see in the world. The last one is a little less swagger and a little more sense serenity. I spoke just a few moments ago about being numb, about how we anesthetize ourselves to stuff out there or in our lives that's too much for us to cope with, that's too challenging, too painful, too hard, too deep, that we've held on to for too long. We numb ourselves to it. And on a day-to-day basis, that's, that's probably okay. But Dana spoke a little earlier about, uh, during the prayer time, about some of the realities that happen around this time of year when families get together and parents are off work and kids are home from school. And some of those things, circumstances, bring those things about which we numb ourselves out into the open. They bring out family violence. They bring out memories of abuse. They bring out hunger. They bring out tragedy and loss. And we're not able to numb ourselves as well as we normally can. And that's where swagger comes in. Because when you swagger, nobody gets really close to you. And you can stay numb in a situation of high anxiety and fear. We swagger through our family uh, times. We swagger at office Christmas parties. We swagger when we are afraid. So this Christmas I want a little less swagger and a little more serenity. Serenity is the place that you can get to when you look at what it is that has made you numb and you choose one of three things. 
you choose to cope with it if it's something that you absolutely can't change or you choose to move beyond it if it is something that you can change and you choose to find out which of those it is if you don't know whether what it is that is that you must numb yourself because of is something that you can change then you never will and if you don't know that it's something that you can't change then you'll never learn how to cope with it it just it will always be there as a threat and as soon as there's a little crack in that swaggering facade it will reach in and grab you by the heart and try to destroy you serenity comes when you know whether it's something you can change or whether it's something you can't and then you'll have in your hands what it is you need to survive and to find a place of serenity if you can change it get every every hand every shoulder every voice every heart you possibly can to add it to the task of making that change and if it's something you can't change then get every hand every shoulder every heart every person who can possibly stand with you in the face of it and find ways to cope and stay strong this christmas a little less swagger a little less hiding what numbs us and a little more serenity every christmas is the last christmas that will ever be like that again next christmas is always a new one make this christmas a christmas that has a little less of those things that bring you down and destroy your heart and that challenge this world a little less of that and a little more of who you truly are and what you truly love and how you are truly to be in a world that needs you not just at christmas but all the year round thank you